All right, hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's great to see everybody. Well, I, I see your names here, I, even though I can't see you, but welcome. Welcome to uh, the third of the Region of Waterloo's Naturescaping webinars. Um, so for those of you who have not taken part in these before, these are in-person garden seminars that we've run in the past. And uh, this, this spring due to uh, obviously the, the COVID-19 situation, we've turned them into online webinars. So um, it's wonderful that uh, you all could be here. So we are uh, just about to get started on our uh, webinar about garden design secrets. Robert Pavlis, uh, he's a master gardener, he's an author and an educator with 40 years of gardening experience. Uh, he's also the owner and developer of Aspen Grove Gardens, a six acre botanical garden that features over 2,500 varieties of plants. So we are uh, very happy to have him with us tonight to speak to us about garden design. Uh, so I will bring Robert in here. Robert, can you hear me? I can, yes. I'm just sharing the screen. And I'll, I'll add your video here um, for a moment. People can see who you are as well once, once we get this, the uh, PowerPoint loaded up. Okay, you should see the PowerPoint first slide now. Perfect, yep, there it is. So I'm bringing up your video. You can say hello to everybody. Oh, uh, okay, that's me. Hi, everybody. It's nice not to see you. <laughs> I can see one face. Uh, it's a little strange sitting here talking to you and not see anybody, but I know you're all there. So are we ready to get started, Scott? Yeah, 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 go ahead. This is, uh, right. I'll pass it over to you. All right, so tonight's talk is about garden design secrets. Uh, and I'm gonna throw in a few other things uh, just to make it a little more interesting. So how do you get in touch with me? Uh, here's how I, you can reach me through social media. I have a YouTube channel called Garden Fundamentals. I also have a Facebook group called Garden Fundamentals and you're welcome to join that. And that's really the best place to ask questions after tonight. Uh, we have a fairly active group there now and uh, lots of science oriented gardeners who will answer your questions for you. And that symbol at the bottom is a blog. So I also have a blog called gardenfundamentals.com. And I post there about once a week. I also run another blog called gardenmyths.com, which I've been doing for about five years. Uh, again, about once a week. So there's lots of information on there. And this is the latest one I put up there. It's a 27 composting myths that will save you time and money. Um, answer lots of your composting questions. I've got a free book for you. So if you go to gardenfundamentals.com and go to the books menu, uh, you can download this book for free. It's a PDF book, so you don't need a reader. It's called 24 and a half garden design ideas. And what I do in this book is I walk around the neighborhood and I pick sort of two areas. One is a new neighborhood and the other one is an old neighborhood so that I kind of cover a wide range of properties. And I critique people's front yards. I literally stand in front of their house and take pictures and critique it. And I try to figure out what is it about this design that's good? What is bad about it? And I go through a number of these in the book and I also show you how to do this yourself. So now that you're home a lot and you're trying to get outside, do some walking, it's a great exercise. And you learn a whole lot by looking at other people's gardens because I think we can be more critical looking at other people's gardens than our, our own and we can see mistakes easier and we can see things we really like and maybe we'll bring those back to our own homes. Just a word of caution here though. Uh, the one time I was walking around the neighborhood and someone called the police on me and the police showed up and wondered why I was taking pictures of people's front yards. So you have to be a little careful, but it's perfectly legal as long as you stay on the sidewalk. I've written a couple books. My first one was called Building Natural Ponds. 
So I wanted to build a pond that had no electricity, no pumps, no filters, no chemicals, completely natural. But it had to be lined because my soil here is mostly sandy and the water would just run away. And at the time, everyone told me that this can't be done. It just won't work. And so about 12 years ago, I went ahead and built it. It was extremely successful. I don't do anything to the pond all year, except once a year, I kind of top it up because we just don't get enough rain here. I've also written a couple of books called Garden Myths. And each one of these has about 120 myths, various topics about gardening. Um, in my myths, I like to look at things that we think we know about gardening but we actually don't. And uh, I put them in my book and I also have my website called gardenmyths.com. And Hot Off the Presses is a book called Soil Science for Gardeners. And in it, I look at the basics of soil. I show you how to analyze your soil, how to understand it, and then how to improve it. And in fact, there is a process that you can go through to develop a personalized soil improvement program for your own garden. Anyways, enough advertising. Let's get on to the program. But before I do, I thought I'd do a little segue and talk about temperatures. Today was actually pretty good out there in the garden. It got nice and warm, but we're expecting a minus four degrees this weekend. And I'm seeing a lot of questions on social media. What do I do with my my plants now that it's going to go to freezing again. Everyone thought the, the summer was here. So I thought I'd quickly go through this. If it's a plant that's been outside, so all of your perennials, all of the trees and shrubs that are in the ground, don't worry about them. They're used to a cold temperature. And if it goes to minus four, most of them will be all right. They'll all live. Some of the tender ones might have some damage to the leaves. So they're making little leaves right now and they're not used to the cold. So they may get damaged, but they'll just grow new ones. So it's not going to be a big deal. If you've gone out to a nursery and bought some plants and brought them home, then it really depends on where they were in the nursery. A lot of nurseries keep them inside in a greenhouse environment and it's a little warmer than outside. And if you have plants like that and they're still in pots, I would probably put them in the garage or even bring them over into the house overnight. Uh, they're not used to the really cold weather. If you have any kind of seedlings, anything you've grown it in the house, they have to come inside. They're not going to take a minus four degrees. Now, if they're already in the garden and in the ground, try covering them with something. It's important that when you cover them that it whatever you use to cover them goes right to the ground. You have to get some heat from the ground trapped under there. Anyways, we're used to this. This is not unusual. Our last frost date around here uh, traditionally was May 24th. It's probably closer to May 8th, May 10th now. And that's what this weekend is going to be. So this is not that unusual. I think we're just very surprised because we had such a great spring already and it was so warm for a couple of weeks. Uh, we don't expect this cold weather, but this is not unusual. So for the most part, don't worry about it. All right, so what makes a garden special? About 15 years ago, I was shopping around for a new house and a new garden. I was going to get a big garden. And so I collected all kinds of pictures of all the gardens that I thought were great. I went through magazines and online and books. And anytime I'd seen something really special, I took a picture of it. Once I had this big pile of material, I sat down and asked myself, why do I think these, this particular picture is that special? Like, why did I take it over all the others? And I think this is a really important question. And the answer I came to was that every time I see a really special garden, it has something unique in it, something that you don't find everywhere. And I think a lot of times we make a mistake by making our gardens look like other people's gardens. And if you do that, they're just not special. Let me show you a couple of pictures. So this is my garden. Uh, it's obviously fall. I mean, it looks pretty. It's nothing unusual there. But it's nothing special. I mean, you can go online and see a million pictures like this. 
there's nothing to really attract you to this garden. But there's also nothing special in the picture. These are nice plants, but they're not that spectacular. Here's another picture of my garden. Uh, again, the plants aren't anything spectacular, but now we have this white pathway going through it lined with these nice limestone rocks. And that is enough to make a garden much more interesting than the previous picture. Now on the left side there, you have a tall miscanthus grass, which is spectacular in the fall. So it does add something to that part of the garden. Structures in the garden, I think, are really important. So here's a couple arbors that I have. Um, they add height to the garden. They add a different look than just plants. Again, the key is something special. Here's a little statue I bought a few years ago. It's supposed to be Mother Nature. I kind of think the face looks very manly, but I didn't make the, the statue. Now, interestingly, it, it sits in this part of the garden because it actually hides my wellhead, which is kind of ugly, and now it looks kind of nice. But again, you see this. If you look in this garden and you kind of glance through it, your eye immediately goes to it, and that's what makes this bed special. It can be a piece of art. Okay? And it can be very simple things. It doesn't have to be an unusual piece of art or painting or something like that. Here's a little garden on the side of a walkway. But rather than put the rock in the bed, which everybody does, this rock is sitting half in the bed and half in the walkway. It's actually sticking out. And the two bushes beside it have been clipped to look kind of roundish, just like another rock. So with some very common evergreens and a rock that's kind of pretty but it's you know it's not super special you suddenly have something very interesting that you won't find in a lot of gardens and that makes this little spot special and then you can always put something really interesting in there uh, one thing about a garden is that it doesn't have to be serious okay now, if I'm decorating my house, I'm going to be a little more careful with colors and design and so on. I mean, I want it to look like a nice house. But in my garden, I can go crazy and put in whatever I want. Here's a good example. Lots of us have sheds. And everybody gets a shed that looks pretty much like this. Why do we do that? Why don't you get a shed that looks like this? Now you've got a really special shed and a special garden. And that makes this garden. Now this one came off the internet, but this one is very similar design. And this one is in Mississauga in a very, very small backyard. In fact, the shed takes up a third of this backyard. Uh, but this, this couple just loves this kind of design. It has a drawbridge that works. It has a little moat. It's got a little chair inside makes this garden so, so, so spectacular. And colors. The garden is a place where you can use lots of weird colors. Make them bright. Uh, too many times we see things like benches and so on that are brown. OK, let's paint them up. Let's use color. It always looks good in a garden. Here's something I did in my garden a couple of years ago. I have this fern gully. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be kind of neat if I had life running around in there? So I went out and got myself a dozen pink flamingos. And they live in there. And this time of year, of course, the ferns aren't up yet. So they're kind of sticking out. But once the ferns grow, it mostly hides them. And uh, now it becomes a surprise when someone's looking at the garden. Now, to be honest, not everyone likes this. My wife actually hates it. But I think it's a fun little thing to do. In fact, my goal this summer is to find some small ones. And I want to make a little nest and have a couple of babies in there with mom and dad standing around them. Let's have some fun in the garden and make it interesting. All right, focal points. Of all the design ideas, I think focal points are probably the most important. 
So here's a definition of what it is. Focal, part, focal points are a way to draw the eye where you want it to go. So if you think about standing in the middle of a garden, where do you want your visitor to look? That's where you put a focal point. Let's have a look at some of these. So this is my backyard again. And I built this hill, I don't know, maybe 12 years ago. Uh, it was all lawn when I moved in. So I got rid of all the grass. There's a pathway that runs up this way, comes up here, crosses the bridge, comes down on the other side and comes out down here. And then I had an open house and all of the people came to this point right here and just stood there and looked up at the hill. Almost nobody went up the hill and yet the path is pretty clear here. And it was a bit of a surprise to me. So the following year I had another open house. And in fact, I have an open house almost every year and I invite the general public. And I do the advertising usually on two places. One is the um, uh, Canadian Gardeners Facebook group. And the other one is the Grand Gardeners Facebook group. And both of those are really good gardening groups to join. And, and I always publicize them there. And I'm the south end of Guelph, so it's not too far for most of you to come. Keep an eye on that website or that, that Facebook group, and, and I'll post it if we have one this year. I don't know. Anyways, the following year, I had another open house, the same hill, but I made one change. And if you keep your eye, I'm having trouble. There we go. There's the cursor. Keep your eye on this part of the hill. I did this. I put up a bench. Everybody came to the bottom here, seen the bench, and went up the hill. Everybody went and sat down on that bench and sat there enjoying the garden until the next group came up. And then they felt obligated to get off the bench and come down. And then the other group sat up there. That bench made such a huge difference in this garden. Now, this focal point isn't that special to look at, but you do see it from most of my garden. But the bench is enough to draw the people up. All right, so that was a success, sort of. The problem with this bench is it looks completely out of place. And I'm going to talk a little bit about scale later on in the program, but the bench is out of scale. It's too small for what is a pretty big hill. This tree over here, by the way, is a 200 year old sugar maple. It's a pretty big tree. And that gives you an idea how dinky the bench is. So I had to put something up there to draw people up. I needed a focal point up there, but the bench wasn't doing it. So this is what I have now. I built myself a little Japanese tea house and uh, there's a surprise up there, which I won't tell you about, but almost everyone that comes to the garden will go up that hill to see the tea house. So it draws people in there. You see it from the front of the property and it becomes the major focal point of the garden. Now, granted, not everybody has a hill this big and a tea house will fit, but you can put something there. There's the view from the top of the hill. Let's have a look at this garden here. So it's a pretty average looking garden. The lawns, nice red flowers. But what if we put a focal point in this garden? How does that change it? it makes a huge difference. Now we have something at the end of the garden that not only draws people's eye, but you also have a destination. It's inviting. If you come to this garden and you and you come to this one, you probably just stand and look at it. But if you come to this one, you will probably go over and sit down and enjoy the garden. And so that's great use of a focal point in a very, very small garden. We're back to my garden. This is my 40 foot arbor. And I decided that at the end of the arbor, I needed something really special. And I actually bought this piece of stone 
Uh, I don't like buying stones. I have lots of my own, but this is a particular nice piece of uh, a granite. And you see it at the end of this tunnel and everybody goes to the end and they go over and they touch this stone. In fact, I haven't planted around the front of it because everybody wants to go right up and, and touch it. So that's another use of a focal point. Now in the middle of summer, this looks a little more interesting and the focal point becomes less important because it's full of clematis. And so you get this beautiful view as you walk down to the end. The Curia Park is in Mississauga. And as far as I know, this is the only Japanese garden in Ontario. Uh, and if I'm wrong, let me know, because I, I love Japanese style gardens. But this one's accessible, it's open, it's free, if you can get into it. Um, it would be beautiful this time of the year. And this is part of the garden. What do we see here? Well, I mean, it's okay. If you look in the background, you can see the high rises from Mississauga and they're hidden pretty well by some pretty standard evergreens. The water's quite nice. There's nothing really special about this picture until we put in a focal point. And this focal point does a couple things. Again, it draws our eye over there, but it also tells us that this is a Japanese garden. And so that one piece of artwork there is defining the style of this garden. It's actually a great garden to go and see. So how do you place a focal point? Where should it go in the garden? Well, here's another focal point. It's a bridge, but it's been painted white, so it sticks out. So ask yourself, where do you want people's eye to go? And the other secret thing is that a lot of times the feet follow the eyes. So if I'm looking at something, there's a good chance I'm going to go over there. If you see this in someone's backyard, I mean, I don't know if you can help yourself, but you've got to go over and find that bridge and see where it goes. This focal point is very obvious. We have a nice walkway here and they put it at the end of the walkway. So of course you're going to walk towards it. Not only that, but it's sitting right on the, the walkway there. So you can go right up to it and touch it. Uh, and I love touching these kind of things. So it's drawing the person through the garden. Here's a very traditional garden, a very traditional focal points. So we're standing where the camera is and we see the first focal point and it draws us in and we walk towards it. When we get here, we see the next one, which is down here, and we walk there. When we get there, there's another one. It's a bench. So you can use your focal points to move through, move, to move your guests through the garden. They walk up to the first one. When they get there, where do you want them to go next? Do you want them to go straight, left, right? Put a focal point wherever you want them to go. Now, focal points aren't always something you have to go to. This is one of my pieces of artwork, and I put it right in the middle of a bed. And it's very clear when you see the bed itself that you can't walk towards it. I've, I've just raised the camera up so you don't see all the shrubbery in front of it. Um, this is a do not touch statue. Uh, but again, it's a focal point. So you're walking along the garden and suddenly you see this out of the corner of your eye. It's kind of hidden a bit between the shrubs and this thing just kind of sticks out. All right, something else that I think is very important is elevations. Now, people with flat gardens, you want hills. People with hills want flat gardens because hills are kind of a pain to work on. But if you can get a garden with some elevations, take it. If you don't have elevations, put some in because it adds so much more interest. Here's a fairly simple garden. It's a nice pergola, nice chairs. You can see that there's a step up to get into it. So that's one set of elevations. And over here on the far right, there's three steps down. So the far right corner is a lower elevation area. 
by adding these slight differences, and we're only talking, you know, six inches difference, we make the whole garden so much more interesting. So if you have a flat garden, and I know most people have, find some way to raise it up. Here's one possibility, make a raised bed at the back. Now I suspect this was probably done the opposite way that they had this raised bed and they actually dug it out to put in the patio. But that elevation adds a whole lot of interest to this garden. The other thing to notice from this is that it's um, done in a very uh, environmentally friendly way. When it rains here, water will infiltrate everywhere. The fact that you used mulch here just allows all the water to run away. Paving stones are good because water can run between them. So this is a very nice environmental garden. It's very simple, but has a lot of interest in it because of the elevations. In garden design, there's something called views. Here's a fantastic view. So you're inside the house. What do you see when you look out your window? Okay. Many of us go out into the garden and then start our design process standing in the garden. But the reality is that we spend most of the time in the house. All winter long, we're in the house looking out. Even in the summertime, when the bugs are too bad, we sit inside the house and look out. So the place to start your garden design is inside the house. Go to all the windows, look out, try and decide what you want to see. You want to see nice things from your main windows. And this is a perfect example. Excuse me. So this is my house. So we have some fairly big windows at the back. And uh, by the way, when I moved into this house, there were no gardens whatsoever. All you did was look out here on, on lawn. So we got rid of the lawn pretty quick. So on the left here, we've got the tea house. Down the middle here, we've got a long waterfall with several ponds coming down to a final pond at the bottom. And both of those have been designed to be very visible from inside the house we spent a lot of time in this room. This is our TV room. And then we've got these cute little chairs that uh, all the ladies who come over like to sit in. And I don't know, they don't do anything for me, but our visitors love these little dinky chairs. Anyways, a nice thing about the chairs is, and we actually picked the chairs for this reason too, is they don't hide the view of the garden. You see right past them. Whereas if we got normal chairs here, they, the backs would be much higher and, and they would hide the view. So that's what we see when we look outside the window. Now views can be very simple. So here we have a hedge. It could be just shrubs. It could be a, a cedar hedge. Cut a little hole into it. Make a little viewing window so that you see something on the other side. Here's a little archway. Now it would be very easy to have this archway and just leave the lawn on the other side and it would be okay, but it would be awfully boring. By putting a bench there with some flowers, we suddenly have something that's really interesting. And as the person is walking along and they see this opening in the hedge, they look through and here's this beautiful view. Here's another one. So you're walking along the pathway and you suddenly have this view. We have this vase sitting in the middle. You've got a tree on the left side, which kind of frames it. You've got another pot and grass on the right side. So you've got another frame there and you have this picture in the middle. So what you want to do is walk around your garden and stop at places you think your visitors will stop and look around. Do you have a nice view? If not, Maybe you should create one there. So here's a very simple garden. That bench really draws me into it. I mean, I think most people are going to walk over to that bench and sit down. 
especially with the flowers behind there. Now the question is, once I'm there and I'm looking back this way to the camera, what am I going to see? There's no point putting a bench somewhere and not giving the person a view once they sit onto that bench. So benches and chairs should be placed so that you always have something interesting to look at. Here's a concept that uh, comes from Japanese gardens. Very nice looking garden. But if you look really closely right here, you actually see the fence. The back of this property is right here. And yet this garden looks huge. We have this big evergreen back here. Or maybe it's not an evergreen, actually it's deciduous. Another nice bush here. And this is called a borrowed view. So what is next to you? What is in the neighbor's yard that you can use to enhance your picture? Sometimes there's some nice stuff there, maybe a fruit tree, maybe a nice maple tree. And sometimes that is ugly and you don't want to borrow it. So have a look past your property and decide which of these views past the property do you want to keep and which do you want to hide? A lot of people will just plant stuff and then they realize, hey, I just put a big tree in front of the nicest borrowed view of my yard. Let's talk a little bit about water conservation. So this is one of my downspouts. In fact, the picture was taken yesterday. So I took it mostly just to show you what it looks like. It's not very nice this time of year. Things haven't really popped yet. But I have the water coming down here and I want to make use of that water. And so I have built a little um, stone river in front of it. And that water comes down and it waters this whole part of the garden. I very rarely water this garden. And part of the reason is that it waters itself. Now, if you want to do a much nicer job, you can build something like this, a rain garden. Now, why do we care about this? Well, if you think about what we've done to this land that we're sitting on, we've, we've taken a huge part of it and covered it with things that do not absorb water. So here we've got the road, we've got the sidewalk, you've got all the roofs of the houses None of that absorbs water. It all collects it and sends it into a narrow channel and a lot of it ends up going to the city. And the city then has to clean that water and has to process it and needs underground pipes that are big enough for all this water. And then we send it down the river to somebody else. Then we complain that our soil is too dry and we have droughts. Well, this whole thing doesn't make a lot of sense. So what's really important is that all of the water that runs off our house and ideally even the driveway and the sidewalks and so on, all that water should be channeled into our gardens. We don't want it leaving the property. And if we can do that, we get a couple benefits. First of all, it's less expensive for the city to take care of this way. And we have to water less, which means we don't have to pay for extra water. So it's really important to have a look at where the water goes and try to keep as much of it on your property as possible. Now, one way that's very common these days is to put in a rain barrel. And here's one that's been painted up by a school group. I mean, these rain barrels are okay, but they're, most of them aren't really that pretty looking. So paint them up. And there's all kinds of ideas on the internet about different ways of painting them up. And I think they look a little more a little nicer that way. If you don't want to paint them, well, then maybe hide them. So here's a nice gate and a little bit of a wall. And when you're in that backyard, you don't get to see the rain barrel. It's hidden behind this wall. Uh, some people even pull it, completely enclose it with wood so you don't see it. But rain barrels are very functional. They collect the water. And then when things are dry, we have excess water that we can use in our gardens. 
Um, just a, a segue here about watering. I've shown you some pictures of my gardens. You've seen the hill. That hill never gets watered. If I put in a new plant, I will water it for the first year. But after the first year, they've got to survive on their own. And that hill never gets watered. My sunny bed hardly ever gets watered. Maybe every three years when we have a really bad drought and we have no rain for four or five weeks, I will water. What I do is mulch and the mulch keeps a lot of moisture in the ground. I also let my plants get drier than most people and they make deep roots. So they're able to survive the dry times. Okay. People who water their plants all the time are really creating an environment uh, uh, very shallow roots. So those plants then need to be watered all the time. When the drought comes, they still need to be watered. You got to lay off the water and just let those plants create deep roots. Now that may mean a few will die because they're just not suited for a drier condition, but that's okay. There are thousands of plants that will do just fine. Now let's talk about scale. Scale is really hard to define. And I haven't really come up with a good definition. But when the scale is right, you will know it. It just looks right. When it's wrong, you'll also know it because it just looks wrong. So let me give you a couple examples. So again, this is my garden. I wanted to build this little bridge over a dry riverbed. And I had to figure out, you know, how big do I make the bridge to make it look like it fits in this garden? How much curvature do I make on there? And I, to be quite honest with you, I just guessed and it came out really good. The size is right for this size of bed. The curvature is interesting. The only problem with it is that when you walk on it, if you're coming down the other side, it's almost too steep and you feel like you're gonna fall off. So although aesthetically it looks really great, uh, functionally it's, it's not the safest bridge to walk on. Now, right behind the bridge is this tall grass here, tall miscanthus. And by the end of the summer, this thing is a seven feet tall. And if you look around it, all the other plants are much smaller. And this thing's huge. And you could make the argument that it's actually out of place. The bed is too small for a plant that is that large. Now, the reason it's still there is that Miscanthus are warm growing grasses. So they don't start growing until June, July. So for most of the year, it's not that big. It only gets this big late in the summer. And I just think it's fantastic when it's that big. So I put up with it, even though it's not really in scale to the rest of the garden. Here's an arbor I built and once it was done, I knew I'd done it wrong. And that's really how I figure out scale. I usually do it wrong a couple of times. The vertical posts are four by fours and the pieces across the top are two by fours. And they're just too small for this size of arbor. I should have went with six by six posts and two by six tops, a little more wood, a little heftier. And in this space, it would have looked so much better. And by the way, this is the garden, one of the gardens, full sun and, and virtually never gets watered. This is another arbor at the other end of the garden. And here I did use bigger wood and it looks so much better. It just seems to fit the space. And that's how you know scale. Fences. Everybody loves to have a fence around their property and I get that. But why do we have to have them so ugly? I mean, this is just terrible looking. Very functional, very cheap, easy to install, at least for the builders, but it's ugly. This isn't a whole lot better. And I see so many gardens where you see these fences. All the gardens on the same street have the same fence. Remember, you want your garden to stand out and look special. Well, if you all have the same fence, you're not going to get to a special point. So here's a garden. It looks a whole lot better with stuff growing in front of it. 
the problem here is that a lot of these plants in here are grasses, at least the taller ones are at the back. And as I said, grasses, warm growing grasses don't really grow until late in the summer. So for a good part of the year and all winter long, you're gonna look at the fence. So although this is an okay solution, it's really not the best solution. How about this? Stick this in the middle of your fence. Now you've got something interesting. You've got something the neighbors will talk about and you have a special garden. This is a nice fence too. It has a couple of things going for itself. One is this painted blue. So we've got more color, but it also has lots of plants that kind of hide the fence. And you can use these outdoor, or sorry, these potted plants, or you can use shrubbery. There's lots of ways to hide fences. Here's a chain link fence, easy to hide. You want something funky in your garden? Make the fence more interesting. Cover it up with nice flowers. Here you hardly notice that this is an ugly fence because you've got such a nice plant in front of it. False perspective. All right, so who thinks this is a tall giant? Well, nobody does because we know that there is no such thing as tall giants, but it illustrates the point of perspective. We have a tall building at the back and we have a picture that looks as if we have a huge human holding it up. And we wanna bring false perspective into our gardens. So here's a pathway. The end that's closest to the camera is wider than the part at the opposite end. By making this pathway slowly get narrower and narrower, we have the impression that this yard is very deep. Here's another great example. It's a little hard, harder to put in your garden, but it looks like these steps are a long way off. But in fact, if you look at the patio stones here, the paving stones, you see how they go up like this. What they've actually done is angled this part. And over here, they've angled it up this way. And as they go back, each one of these is smaller and smaller and smaller. So it looks as if this is a huge structure, but in fact, it's actually a pretty small structure. Now you can do things in your garden fairly easily. Let's say you have two planters like this. Most people are gonna get the same size pots, put in the same size evergreens, and that's okay. But if you have two lined up like this and you take the one that's closest to your visitor and make it a bit bigger. So you make a bigger pot here and a smaller pot here, a bigger evergreen here and a smaller evergreen here, it'll make your yard look so much deeper. This is another example where you can trim the evergreens to give you that look of depth. So how do you make a small yard feel bigger? I've mentioned several things already, but here's a couple other tricks. Put in false doors. Now I know this one's on a brick wall and it hasn't been cleaned up very well, but you can do the same thing on your standard wood fence. Put in a gate. It won't go anywhere. It doesn't even have to open. It just needs to look like a gate. And people will think your property is much bigger than it really is. Here's a fake window. So we've got this window and we put a mirror inside. Now you think there's something on the other side which makes this garden seem so much bigger. And you've got mystery on the other side of this window. And yet it's actually put onto a solid wall could be a shed, could be one of those wood fences. This adds depth to the garden and makes it more interesting. Side gardens, they're all tiny little things. And so what people do is they put in tiny plants. And when you put in tiny plants into a tiny garden, you end up with a garden that looks tiny. You have to put in big stuff and you have to go high. This isn't very wide here, but it's very interesting. It's got different types of floors, different pathways, but it goes up, gives you lots of things to look at. And now you have a space that actually looks much bigger than it really is. 
This is one of the perfect ways to enlarge your garden. Have a pathway that seems to go on forever. If you're standing here and looking at this, you're looking along this pathway, you don't know where the end of this garden is. Okay? The back fence is all covered in greenery. You can't see it. This could go on forever. By putting this kind of a pathway in and by putting in more vertical things like shrubs or, or wooden structures, so you can't actually see the whole garden at once, you give the viewer the impression that this is a really large space. Or create a little garden like this that's tucked away behind a bunch of bushes. So when I started my garden here, the first thing I did is I went out and started collecting pictures of gardens that I liked or things that I liked. And then when it came time to actually finish the garden, to put things in, I look at that picture file. And I look at that picture file all the time. And I'm looking for ideas. Here's a picture. Um, now it's an okay backyard. What I really like here is the fact that they've put this deck right on the ground. And I could maybe use that in part of my garden. I also like these vertical trees here. See, they have an ugly fence too, but they put a few trees and evergreens in here. And that looks really nice. So what you do with this picture file is you take out ideas. You don't copy the whole picture, but you try to find something in here that you like, and then you use it. I'm not quite sure where I'd use this, but I think this is really kind of neat. Here's a little garden. And rather than putting up a fence, which would be very traditional, or an evergreen hedge, very traditional, they have this unique structure, which I've never seen before. Some big posts, some metal cross pieces. I don't really care for these uh, wires going up and down, but my guess is these are clematis. And clematis will grow up here like crazy. So these will look great later in summer when they're covered in flowers. So you've got a trellis here that's much more interesting than the things most people use, much more unusual, so I love that but maybe the rest of the garden I wouldn't use. Here's a picture. Okay, we use patio stones. Those are pretty common. This has a dry riverbed running across it, which you don't see very often. But then they made this simple, simple bridge. Just some boards. But notice that the boards are cut into different shapes. Each one's a little different diameter or width. Each one's a little different length. They're not quite cut straight, so they're a little crooked. And suddenly you have this very interesting little structure in the garden that's really easy to build. Buy some wood, cut it up a little bit, lay it on the ground, and you're done. No concrete, no nails, no nothing. You've got yourself an interesting bridge. So I look at these pictures, and I look at what is in this picture I really like. And I might just steal this one piece and put it somewhere in my garden. Here's some more ugly fences. I'm not sure what they're really doing here. Um, we've got a pathway going to the back corner and this doesn't really look like a gate. So I'm a little confused here. If this had been built like a gate where you actually had a handle and some hinges, even if it never opened, this would be great because then I think, oh, this guy's got a huge backyard. I want to go see this, his other garden. And yet it's a dead end. So that's a good idea. I might use that one. And one more little idea. Do something quirky in the garden. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be expensive. Here's a little uh, statue and a little mirror. And you can put this just about in any garden and add interest. And when the person walks along here, they'll get a little chuckle out of it and they'll enjoy the garden so much more. Anyways, that's it. Thanks very much. I have a couple screens here for photo credits of some of the pictures I've used, but I'll turn it over to Scott and he can uh, 
see if there's some questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. It was great. I love the photos and uh, yeah, the, the insight into what makes a great garden. Uh, I'm just turning on the chat here for everybody. Uh, so yeah, you, uh, if you had a question for Robert uh, during the presentation, uh, you can start typing that into the chat box and uh, I will really relay those to him. All right. Uh, so Sharon is wondering, Robert, uh, uh, she planted 30 tiger lilies today. Uh, so will they be okay tonight? Sure. Remember, we're, we're going down to minus four, which is not that cold. And the tiger lilies are several inches below the surface of the soil. And down there, it's not going to go minus four. Okay, so it's the temperature down there is hardly going to change overnight. So that's not a problem. All right, uh, Sasha is wondering, uh, how can you make a backyard seem smaller? I have a large field for a backyard and I want it to seem smaller and cozier. Ah, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, interestingly, when I moved here, uh, I, have a fair, I have six acres, so it's, it's fairly big. And my plan was to make garden rooms. So you can take a large area and just cut it up into smaller areas. And if you plant a lot of shrubs close to the house, you'll suddenly have a small yard. And now in those shrubs, you leave some openings so you can walk into another garden. And the idea of making these garden rooms is, is very popular. You just need something that's tall enough so you can't see over it when you're sitting in the smaller space, right? So you can have a patio, uh, have some things around it. It doesn't have to be very big. Surround that with something tall. And so the secret is tall and, and shrubs are maybe the easiest, but you can combine it with some uh, wood structures, some, some fencing, some shrubs. And once those are grown up to be six, seven feet, you'll have this tiny little space. Okay. Uh... Lois is wondering, do you put ground cloth on the inside of your rocks to hold the earth in? Uh, I think you're probably talking about the weed barrier material. And the answer is virtually never. Uh, I don't think weed barrier should be put anywhere in the garden. There's one exception. If you're using these large armor stones, they're very hard to fit together so the soil doesn't run out between them. And so there is some value in putting the weed berry behind those stones. But if you're making things like rock walls, uh, you don't need it. I, I don't use them behind any of my rocks. Uh, just learn to stack the rocks so you can make a good wall. And in fact, I have a YouTube video that shows you how to do that and you just fill soil behind them. The plants will hold the soil in. And don't use weed barrier to keep out weeds. It doesn't work. OK. Uh, I'm just sharing uh, a screen here. I wanted to mention something before we take any more questions, because uh, I know uh, people tend to drop out as, as the questions go on. Uh, while I still have the captive audience. I wanna let you know about another webinar that's being held uh, on May 20th. Let me, uh, there we go. Um, so uh, the local environmental group Reap Green Solutions is, uh, is planning a rain barrel webinar on May 20th. So it's, uh, uh, oh, this one, it says 7 a.m. but that should be 7 p.m. 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, Wednesday, May 20th. So this will be some information about how to set up your rain barrel and uh, um, how to how to use utilize it uh, around your home. So uh, you can search for that on Eventbrite or there should be information on Reap Green's uh, website, which is reapgreen.ca. Uh, thanks for allowing that diversion there, Robert. 
Um, the next question is from Andrea, who's wondering, uh, I planted lettuce seeds and peas a couple of weeks ago, and they're just starting to come up. Will they be okay, or should I cover them? Uh, they should be fine. Uh, my peas were planted uh, over a month ago. Uh, they're, they've had several frosts. They're fine. The lettuce should also be fine. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, Dot had a very similar question about covering her lettuce, radishes, and spinach. So I'm going to assume that's the same answer there. Uh, yeah. Sharon is wondering, what is the secret to growing ferns? Uh, oh, um, ferns are actually really easy to grow. But, and there's always a but, you have to know how they like to grow. So if you look up ferns, you'll find one class of ferns that like to be very dry and another class that likes to be very wet. And you have to get that part of it correct. So for instance, I have some ferns that are actually growing on limestone rocks. They never get watered. They get a little water when it rains and then it dries out really quick and they survive on that. But these are ferns that like to be dry. I have other ferns like the maidenhair fern, which is an Ontario native. And if it's too dry, it just gets smaller and smaller every year and it doesn't do well. So you have to look up the fern and find out what the watering conditions that it prefers. And if you meet that, then they're pretty easy to grow. They're actually really tough plants, but you, you have to get that part right. Some of them are also uh, fussy about light. So some like it really sunny and some like it a bit shady, but I find the water more important. Okay, Kiki is wondering if you have ideas for renters um, who want better design but don't want to put up something too permanent or expensive that landlords may remove like a, like a tree. Oh, that's a tricky one. Well, what I would tend to do is to buy things that are movable and just take them with you. So for instance, you can get yourself some really nice statues and just take them with you and then you haven't lost anything, right? So that's one way. Uh, the other thing is to use perennials. Uh, you can get tall perennials that grow fairly quickly into a tall plant and uh, you know in two years you've, you've got yourself an eight foot uh, perennial uh, rather than trying to get a shrub which may take three or four years to get a good size. Perennials are also much easier to take with you when you move. You can just dig them up, pot them up and away they go. Whereas trees once they're established are so much harder to dig out. The other thing is to do cheap things. Uh, I don't know if you're allowed to paint those fences but paint them up. Um, uh, things like clematis grow fairly quickly up a chain link fence and can pretty much hide it in a year. Certainly the second year they hide it pretty well. You can also get annuals. So you can get annual sweet peas, plant those, they'll cover it. Morning glories are annuals. So you can get morning glories, put them in, they'll grow uh, 10 feet this summer. Okay, um, I was scrolling through the questions and I saw this one, I thought I'd address it right away. Uh, this webinar is being recorded for YouTube. So uh, if you've missed anything or you wanna go back and review something that Robert said, uh, it'll be available on youtube.com slash region of Waterloo. And that'll probably be live, uh, like the recording will be on that page uh, tomorrow, I would expect. So um, yeah, there's a... Uh, you're welcome to go back and, and review. Uh, the next question is from Anne. Uh, do you have a suggestion on how to combine function like vegetables and raspberries with the pretty elements like shrubs and flowers? Um, yeah, a lot of people think vegetable gardens are pretty, but I don't. I think they're typically very functional and kind of ugly. Um, but if you sprinkle them inside your flower beds, then you won't notice them. You can put a tomato plant, you know, beside your um, coreopsis and it will just look like another plant and you won't even notice it's a vegetable plant. So the trick is just to intermingle them as much as possible. Okay. Uh 
Janet is wondering which plants do you choose to grow in shade gardens? Oh, uh, I have hundreds of them. <laughs> I love hostas. I, I know they're very common, uh, but the reason I like hostas is, is that uh, they're idiot proof plants. You never have to do anything to them. Uh, I don't cut the leaves off. I just leave them on the ground and the new ones cover it off. All I do in the spring is I go and I break off the flower stems from last year and some of the hostas don't even flower. So you don't even have that. So you don't have to do anything to them. You don't have to water them. You don't have to fertilize them. Just plant them and forget them. Um, Epimediums are quite good. They're less known. Um, I do have a YouTube uh, video just on shade gardens and it has a whole list of flowers there. Um, oh, there's, there's just so many. Um, I love primulas, uh, but the primulas that are for sale in the stores, like in grocery stores and so on, those are not really hardy here. You have to get real primulas for the garden and then they'll come back year after year. Uh, but they're just starting to flower now and they're going, they have the, such lovely colors and they're going to flower for the next six weeks, depending on which one it is. Um, I don't know if I mentioned the epimediums are really nice plants. The flowers aren't that spectacular, but they make nice clumps and you never have to do anything with them. They're, they're pretty tough. They can take a dry conditions. Uh, and they can take fairly deep shade. Uh, Angela says, uh, I noticed your nice green grass. How do you maintain your grass? Um, well, grass is a funny thing. Um, I mow it. I do fertilize it. So uh, if I go back 20 years, I never fertilized the lawn. But I did spot spray with a herbicide to get rid of the, the dandelions. But I didn't spray the whole lawn. I would go and I would just spot spray here and there and use very little uh, herbicide. So now we, we don't have that herbicide to use. And the lawn really needs a bit of fertilizer. So I do fertilize it. And I have traditionally fertilized in the spring. The latest re research shows that it's actually better to fertilize in the fall, sort of early fall, say early September. Um, so I usually do one fertilizing with urea. You have to be very careful with urea because it can burn your lawn. So you have to be very careful how you spread it. And I never water my lawn. So uh, in the middle of summer, if you come to my garden, it's brown and looks completely dead. So, and that's okay, it's still alive. It just goes through this cycle and it's brown. So I never water. That means the grass roots are a little deeper than normal and I feed it a little bit. All right, the next question is from Joanne. Uh, she's wondering, is it worth it to have someone design a garden for you or should you go with what you like? Um, well, that's not an A or B choice. So you said, should you go with what you like? And the answer is always yes. So I actually teach a design course. And one of the first things I tell students right the first 20 minutes is there is no such thing as a wrong design. If you want pink flamingos in your garden, that is the right design. Okay. One of the great things about gardens is that you can do anything you want and nobody really cares. They might not like your style, they might not like your garden, but um, nobody gets offended if you have weird colors out there or you collect hubcaps and you cover your back fence with hubcaps, so what? Do what you really want to do. The second, the other question, I think it's a completely different question is, should you get someone to design the garden for you? Um, my answer would be probably no. Um, and here's why. I think that, you know, garden is a great hobby and has various aspects to it. And design is one of those aspects. And by doing the design yourself, you'll get better at it. 
and your first design won't be that great. But you'll learn a whole lot about your garden and you'll learn about your likes and dislikes. Um, it is good though to spend some time learning about the design process before you go and do it. Um, but even that's not necessary. Uh, most gardeners start by throwing in a bunch of plants and that's okay. And they love the plants and they like the flowers and they like the colors and that's great. And then as you get more experienced, you'll start looking at designs and seeing, well, plants can be put together different ways. We can have a different pathway. We can use some hardscape here. We can make things look better. The other thing I strongly suggest is going on local garden tours. And I'm sure Waterloo has them. Uh, every city has these summer tours where you can go and see other people's gardens. And they're great because you get to see all kinds of things you never thought of. And uh, get a copy of my ebook, that free ebook, and go around your neighborhood and critique your neighbors. If you start critiquing other people's gardens, you'll become a much better designer yourself. But I think design is part of the fun of having a garden. So I wouldn't hire someone to design it. I might hire someone to actually do the heavy lifting. That's not so much fun, maybe. But the design part is, is enjoyable. Uh, Roseanne is wondering, what would you suggest putting in front of a swim spa eight by 14 in a shady backyard uh, that's five feet off the ground? The garage wall is at the back of the tub, a boring brick wall. I'm a little lost. Yeah. <laughs> it's a swim, a swim spot. So yeah. like a swimming pool. I think so. I think so. Uh, yeah. In a shady backyard. It's up off the ground. So it's like a, a raised swimming pool. I, I'd have yeah. to, I'd have to see it. Mm -hmm. um, when you're design, the, the reason that it's, it's really hard to answer because um, here's my design process in, in 30 seconds. Um, you start out by understanding what your needs are. How are you going to use the space? The second step is, what do you like? What are your preferences? And everybody's different. So I can't tell you what you should put there because I don't know what your needs are. I don't know what your likes are. I don't know if you like bright colors, if you like pastels. Do you like evergreens? Do you hate evergreens? I mean, I can give you a list of plants to put there, but that doesn't mean anything. You really have to design the space for yourself. And the only way you can do that is to understand your wants and needs in the garden. And so you have to approach it from a different angle. Um, I mean, I can give you a list of plants that will grow there, but you might not like them. Uh, Cheryl is wondering, uh, she says she has water staying in her backyard. Um, how do you prevent uh, your watery area from becoming a mosquito breeding area? Okay, so this is like a wetland? I think so, yeah. Well, if, if you have a, a, a wetland, a boggy area where water sits all the, the time, um, it's going to breed mosquitoes. I mean, there, there's not much you can do about it. You can get something called mosquito dunks, which is a bacteria that uh, will go into the water. It won't harm anything else except uh, different types of insect larvae, so particularly mosquito larvae. Um, but again, if it's a larger area, that doesn't make much sense. And if it's a small area, I, I, I would think it dries up. The other approach is to solve the problem. Like, why is it wet? And again, you'd have to see what it looks like. If, if, again, if it's a small area, there's ways to drain that area so it dries up. If it's a large area and, and part of it is on other people's property, then of course you have a completely different problem. But if you have standing water there that's all the time and it's natural there, then you're gonna have breeding mosquitoes. Debbie is wondering, how do I make my backyard pond clean and clear now with so many dead leaves in it? Well, uh, scoop the leaves out. Um, so um, it, it is a good idea on an annual basis and either in the fall or early spring, scoop all the loose stuff out of the pond and take it out. The reason is that those leaves start 
decomposing and they add nutrients to the water. And when there's too many nutrients, algae grows. Okay. If you don't have the nutrients, you won't get any algae. The second thing you want to do is you want to have plants growing in that pond. Plants uh, need less nutrients than the algae. So if you only have a small amount of nutrients, the plants will use it up. And it, the algae won't get enough and it will die off and not grow. Do you have a preferred uh, tool for getting rid of those leaves from your own pond? I, I just use a fish net, like a, a proper pond net. It's about a foot by foot sort of square. And uh, it looks like a regular fish net and they scoop out pretty easily with that. You can get it anywhere that sells pond supplies. Yeah, Denise is wondering, uh, she says, we have a low lying shaded area in our garden against a fence. Would cedars be a good shrub to plant because they like water? Uh, or what other plants could work besides cedars? Um, well, cedars work well. They're very hardy here. They grow well, but they need moisture. So if this is an area that always stays wet, then cedars will probably do quite well. Um, it really depends on how wet this is. If, if it's not really wet, then you can plant most things in that area. Uh, but cedars would do very well. But I see a lot of people planting cedars in places that are far too dry, which means you either have to water them all the time for the rest of their life or they're going to go brown. So uh, I stay away from cedars unless you know it's a wet area. A plant that looks very similar to a cedar but can take much drier conditions um, is a, called a false, uh, a false cypress. If you look for a false cypress, then they kind of look like a cedar. They're very easy to grow, but they can take quite dry conditions. Okay, uh, Joanne uh, says, I'm interested in vertical woven fences for privacy. Are they commercially available? Um, I'm not sure. No. Yeah, I'm not sure what the vertical woven fence is either. Um, uh, Stan wonders if you have a suggestion for a garden around a pool with no yard. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a garden? A garden around a pool with around no yard. Around a pool with, with no fencing. Um, I, again, I, you have to understand what the requirements are. Are you, are you trying to keep kids or dogs in? Are you just trying to keep the neighbors from watching you swim? Uh, it, it really depends on, on what your, your needs are there. Uh, I mean, if it was me and I was mostly looking for some privacy and I don't want to use a regular fence, I would just go with shrubs. Uh, put up a bunch of different shrubs, make a shrub hedge, but where each shrub is a different kind of shrub. You know, a lilac, a forsythia, this and that. There's, there's hundreds of shrubs you can go and get. They, if you pick the right ones, they'll bloom at different times of the year. So you'll have color there. Uh, you get different shaped ones, and now you have this enclosure that's, uh, you know, it, it, it's a soft enclosure. It's not hard like a fence. So that's what I would tend to go with. Okay, uh, Lynn is wondering what you recommend for edges of gardens. Uh, there's no good solution. Uh, I've tried everything. Um, if I had a small garden, I think I would go with plastic edging, but get a really good quality one, not the kind that you would get in a Home Depot type, Canadian Tire type store. That's, that stuff's too, too soft and too weak. You want to go find a landscape company and buy some really good solid edging. It's quite thick, and then it needs to be installed correctly and it won't move. And by install correctly, you have to have that the edging goes vertical and you have to have some pins that are horizontal holding it in place so it doesn't heave during the winter. Now, that will work if it's installed properly. On a larger garden, it, it just becomes ridiculously expensive and that's why I don't use it. 
Okay, Roland uh, says, I have two large black walnut trees, very tough for summer and fall colors. Do you have any recommendations? Well, one of the problems with walnut trees is that everybody is on the under the impression that nothing grows under a walnut tree because it produces this chemical called juglone. And that's really not true. Almost anything can be grown under a walnut tree. The problem under a walnut tree is that it's very dry, it has a fair amount of shade, and so it's a difficult place to grow. But if you put in mature plants, almost anything will grow there. Uh, you will have to water a little more because the tree's sucking all the water away, um, but you can plant all kinds of things there. Anything that's good for a shade garden will do quite well there. Uh, Denise is wondering where you can buy a unique shed, uh, like the two examples that you showed us. <laughs> uh, you can buy anything online now, but uh, this, certainly the second one I showed, they built it. Um, my tea house I built, so I, you'd have a hard time. I don't think you could buy something like that. So I think if you want a really weird one, you probably need to either uh, build it yourself or hire someone to build it. But if you Google it, I'm sure somebody sells it. It's, it's just a question of whether they're, they're local enough to you that it's economical to bring it in and, and so on. Um, but if you find someone who uh, uh, does just custom outdoor structures, they won't have any problem building a shed like that. Uh, structure, structurally, they're no harder to build in a regular shed. I'll have to consider that, Robert. I need to replace my own shed. So yeah, if I do that, I'll send you a, pi a picture. Yeah, the, now there's one little catch you have to be careful of, and, and that is you, you want to check with the city regulations. Um, but if, if the sh in Guelph, at least, if the shed's under 110 square feet, you don't need a permit. And then you can put in pretty much any structure you want. So the roof on my Japanese tea house is, is kind of a unique roof. And so I built it just at the border of the 110 square feet. If I went larger, I would have had to get an engineering company to certify that roof, which would have cost me a fortune. So mm -hmm. More than most of us would want to spend on a shed or a, a small yeah. structure. Yeah. Um, okay, John is wondering, uh, he says, I back onto a bush. What could I plant around my wood deck that works in the shade? Um, I, I, again, are you looking for, uh, well, I'll give you an example. One plant that I really like that makes a really big statement is something called a regersia. Makes big leaves, looks kind of like a, um, a rhubarb plant makes really nice flowers, uh, can be a big plant if you want, uh, likes a bit of moisture and shade. So I grow it on the north side of my house. Uh, I don't water it there. It's, there's enough moisture in the ground on the north side that it, it doesn't need watering. Um, but it grows great and it's a spectacular looking plant. Um, what's harder in shade is to find uh, shrubs that like heavy shade, and there are not many around. Um, some of the native dogwoods are okay. The alternate leaf dogwood uh, can grow in quite heavy shade. Um, some of the flowering dogwoods would do all right if it's sort of part shade. And so if you want something higher, you can go with something like that. Okay, I think we're just down to the last question here. Um, if anyone sends in a last second one, I will, I'll pass it on to Robert. But uh, Marlon is wondering, uh, is there a really hardy shade tolerant ground cover for clay soil to help with erosion on a steep incline? Yeah. That's a pretty specific question. I can repeat yeah. that. So, so steep um, clay soil and yeah. shade. Shade. shade tolerant uh, ground cover yeah uh, well assuming you're not walking on it a lot which i think is probably true if it's you know very steep uh, a juga works great a juga will cover the ground is once it's there it's quite solid 
uh, works well. It grows well in Guelph when we have clay soil, grow great on a hill, uh, likes shade. It can take quite deep shade, has blue flowers. So it's even flowering part of the season. And um, the other one that I like uh, is um, a geranium. It's a native plant uh, called the big leaf geranium. Um, what's it called? Uh, geranium mycorrhizum. It's an Ontario native, gives you a nice solid uh, cover. It's already green. So right now, when I look out the window, it's, it's already covered the area. And I put that anywhere that I don't want to garden and I don't want to weed. Because once it's established, nothing grows through it. It's thick enough. It has flowers for about a week in the summer. Uh, they're not spectacular flowers, but they're OK. And uh, the rest of the year, it just looks great. From early, early spring to winter time, it'll be green and you have this nice carpet. It's, it's not the best plant to walk on. So I wouldn't put it in areas where you got traffic. Um, you know, the occasional footstep would be okay, but you, you, you don't want to put that where you walk. Uh, but those two both work quite well in shade and in clay. Okay, uh, one more question did come in. Uh... Would you have any plant suggestions for all day sun, uh, an all day sun area with clay soil? Um, just about anything. <laughs> oh, the, the list is endless. I, I only have like 2000 plants that grow in that condition. Um, if you're a new gardener, I like day lilies. They come in lots of different colors. They are so tough, you can't kill them. Uh, but you get yourself some really nice ones, not the common ones uh, that grow in ditches and so on. Get yourself some really nice ones, uh, really tough plants. <clears throat> right now in my garden, uh, my sunny beds are full of daffodils. I have around 80 different kinds of daffodils. So that's my spring show. Um, but quite honestly, the clay that we have in this area, the Guelph Kitchener area, um, um, is, is not a heavy clay and almost anything will grow in it. So really any kind of um, sunny plants will grow well in it. Um, later on in the summer, I love Rebecca's. Again, a very tough plant, but get the common one, not the fancy colored ones. Just get a, a, a common yellow Rebecca's, um, great plants. Okay, great. Uh, let's close it off there. So thank you very much, Robert. Um, oh, you're welcome. And, uh, yeah, on behalf of the region of Waterloo, um, yeah, I, I'm glad that we could gather the gardening community together uh, this way, even if we couldn't do these seminars in person. So uh, thank you to, to you and thank you to everybody who joined us tonight. Well, thanks uh, very much. Yeah. It was great. I'll remind everybody that this uh, recording will be on YouTube later on. So if you want to watch it, uh, you can do so there. I'll also uh, send a follow-up email to you with a link to that video, uh, as well as our other naturescaping webinars are also recorded and you can see them on our YouTube page. Um, and a, a quick reminder too about Reap's Rain Barrel webinar on May 20th. Uh, keep your eyes open for that if you're interested. So thanks everybody. Um, Appreciate you being here and maybe we'll see you next week for the fourth Naturescaping webinar. All right. Well, thanks very much, Scott.